we've saved Revelation as the last book in our overview of the Bible for a couple of reasons. First of all, Revelation is the final book of the Bible and a capstone of sorts for the Bible whole, Bible's whole story. In addition, while speaking very clearly from a New Testament perspective, Revelation draws heavily on Old Testament imagery uh, taken from prophets like Ezekiel, Joel, and particularly Daniel. Uh, Adding to the challenge of interpreting Revelation is its unique blend of literary genres. Uh, Revelation is a letter, like many other letters we've explored in the New Testament. It's addressed from a specific person, John, to seven particular churches in Asia Minor. This means that, like all letters, Revelation is situational. It's addressing something that the recipients of the letter are experiencing in their own time. It's meant to have meaning for them in their own historical context as first century residents of the Roman Empire. However, Revelation is not just a letter, it's also an apocalypse. Uh, Many people associate the word apocalypse with the end of the world, Uh, but the word literally means revelation or unveiling. Uh, Historically, apocalyptic literature was written by people in crisis or, or people who were experiencing some kind of intense pressure. An apocalypse offers a glimpse behind the scenes of history as we currently experience it, allowing us to see what's really going on and what's really at stake. Uh, One of the features of apocalypses as crisis literature that might stand out as you read Revelation is that they tend toward dualism. Uh, They see a kind of cosmic struggle between good and evil unfolding at the heart of history. There is no truly neutral territory. Uh, One way or another, every person is a player in the struggle, and the side we take will have lasting consequences. Uh, But the feature that really makes an apocalypse immediately recognizable is its penchant for symbolism. Uh, Revelation is packed full of symbolic numbers and colors and fantastical images like beasts with multiple heads. All of the symbols and the dramatic imagery are tools to help depict cosmic realities that are too large and strange for ordinary language. Uh, For people who are living under threat, they also have an added benefit of making a sensitive message clear to people who hold the interpretive key, while remaining completely opaque to everyone else on the outside. When it comes to interpretation, uh, Revelation tends to be one of the most polarized books of the Bible. Uh, Some interpreters view Revelation as the story of what's still to come. They see Revelation's symbolism as pointing to specific future events, a kind of timeline for the end of time. Uh, This was the approach famously taken by the popular fiction series Left Behind. Uh, Other interpreters view Revelation primarily as a story of the past. They see its symbolism as pointing toward people and events that were recognizable in the context of the first century. I, I think the evidence is mixed because both views are partly right. As a letter, Revelation addresses a specific situation in its own time. A statewide persecution in which Christians were rounded up in large numbers and martyred hadn't yet begun at the time Revelation was written. But that threat was on the horizon, and already persecution was beginning to heat up in local settings. Christians throughout the Roman Empire were particularly under pressure economically. The temptation was strong for them to compromise their convictions and conform with, into the lifestyles of their neighbors before loyalty to Jesus started costing them too much. 
Uh, Many details of John's letter address leaders and events that were recognizable in his own time. Babylon, an ancient empire that's mentioned often in Revelation, is very clearly a symbolic stand-in for Rome, which is under the judgment of God. But Babylon doesn't only represent Rome. Babylon also serves as a symbol of all human empires. The implications of John's message about worship and compromise apply not just to Christians of Rome, but to all Christians who are tempted to split their allegiance between Jesus and the kingdoms of the world. Revelation 18 is a good place to look to understand John's major concerns. Here's the charge against Babylon, Rome, and all human kingdoms. It's laid out in chapter 18. Uh, Babylon is arrogant and overconfident that she is untouchable. Her kings and her leaders are accused of sexual immorality, which in Revelation is a symbolic way of talking about idol worship. But tellingly, the harshest words are reserved for the merchants who are peddling in luxuries. Babylon has sold her soul for greed and wealth and consumer goods. Even human lives have become just another commodity. God's just judgment is about to fall. And God's people are called to come out. To come out and be saved from her crumbling. John addresses the temptation to conform and compromise by taking a big picture view of the cosmos and of where history is going. This is why a letter that's meant to address the present takes up the subject of the future. John's intention isn't to provide some kind of secret information. It's to remind people of what Jesus taught openly about where history is headed. John isn't so much predicting the future as he is proclaiming the future. He understands that the future we expect makes a great deal of difference to the cost-benefit analysis of the choices we're making right now. All people in all empires are called to come out and be saved. Uh, Ironically, one of the most common mistakes in reading an apocalypse is actually over-interpreting. A professor of mine used to say that reading an apocalypse is sort of like looking at a painting. You can examine the individual strokes that make up a painting, but the point of the painting is the emotional and psychological impact of the whole piece of art. You haven't really seen a painting's message until you've stepped back and absorbed the way the whole picture works together. As we read Revelation, we should be wary of attempts to tie specific details from the book to events in our own day. Revelation certainly has something to say to our time and place, just as it did to first century Rome. Uh, we might find that many of its insights strike particularly close to home. Uh, The story that John is telling us about the shape of power and the corruption of nations and the movement of history is relevant at every time. It's a story about how the world was and is that will keep on replaying itself until God's kingdom comes. Therefore, it's not surprising at all if we read this book and think, That sounds just like today. But observing major patterns that bind history together is a very different thing from attaching somewhat arbitrary meaning to particular symbols. Um, For example, uh, one commentary that I own suggests that the grasshoppers in Revelation stand for the helicopters in the Vietnam War. Presumably, this association was made because somebody noticed that grasshopper wings are shaped something like helicopter blades. But while this connection might make perfect intuitive sense in the context of the 1960s, grasshopper wings presumably reminded people in the 1300s of something else very different. And they'll probably remind people in the year 3000 of something else entirely. 
Uh, these kind of associations often work more like a psychological inkblot test than they do an act of true biblical interpretation. Uh, Revelation is full of symbols, but not every dragon toenail stands for something else. Uh, some details exist just to fill out a vivid picture. It's possible to overload small details with so much significance that the larger storyline collapses under the excessive interpretive weight. Uh, when we interpret Revelation, it's crucial to keep our eye on the overall message. Even if we're not sure what to make of a particular detail, the integrity of the larger storyline still holds together. If you try to construct a clear timeline of the events depicted by Revelation, you're likely to end up rather confused. That's because events in Revelation don't proceed in a strictly linear fashion. Now, chapter 1 sets the stage for the letter with an opening vision of Jesus. Chapters 2 and 3 contain specific messages for particular churches. And the rest of the book is composed of a series of visions that move back and forth between heaven and earth. Now, one moment we get a snapshot of something unfolding on earth within human history. And the next moment, the camera suddenly shifts upward toward heaven, and we see the spiritual realities that are unfolding outside of sight and outside of time. Uh, the story advances in a kind of spiral pattern instead of in a straight line. Uh, sometimes the same events may be described multiple times using different metaphors. Uh, this movement back and forth and up and down, might scramble a timeline. But remember, John's primary purpose is not to predict a particular series of future events, but to put the present in the context of the larger cosmic struggle that will finally result in God's victory. One of the things that strikes many people about Revelation is how bloody and violent some of the scenes feel. At least on the surface, the imagery often seems to have more in common with darker scenes from the Old Testament than it does with the gospel's depiction of Jesus. But, but remember, Revelation runs on image and metaphor. The critical interpretive question is what larger truths an image is intended to communicate. Uh, not everything is as it first appears. And the interpretive key to unlocking all of the symbolism of Revelation is given to us in the opening visions found in chapter 1 and chapters 4 to 5. In the opening vision of Revelation 1, the first thing we see in this book is Jesus in his heavenly form. And one of the crucial and the surprising details to notice is where Jesus' weapon is. Now, the victorious Jesus does have a sharp sword, but it isn't in his hand where we'd expect it to be. Instead, it's coming out of his mouth. And symbolically, this indicates that the sword that Jesus is wielding is not a literal weapon at all, but the word, the truth of God. From the very first sentences of the book, we're told that Jesus' chosen weapon is God's word of truth. And this sets a fundamental framework for how we're meant to interpret the metaphors of war and battle that occupy much of the rest of the book. If that opening vision in chapter 1 wasn't clear enough in the clues, uh, the following vision of the throne room of heaven in chapters 4 to 5 gets even more explicit. At the start of Revelation 5, we get a glimpse of the one who has conquered history. A voice in heaven cries, Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. Lions are a common Old Testament symbol of royalty, strength, and fierceness. God is often depicted as a lion devouring God's enemies in judgment. No one in heaven or on earth would be surprised to see a lion conquer. But when John looks where he's pointed, what he sees is not a lion at all, but a lamb. 
a lamb that looks as if it has been slaughtered. This lamb has seven uh, horns and seven eyes. Uh, Horns are common symbols of power, and eyes are symbols of wisdom. Seven is a number in Revelation that symbolizes completeness. In symbolic terms, this lamb is no weakling. But the power that he wields is not the power of the lion, the power of tearing and devouring one's enemies. This slain lamb is wielding the power of his own death blow. The power that turns the cosmos, the power that conquers history, turns out to be the power of self-sacrifice, the power of the cross. This shocking revelation is the interpretive key to understanding the rest of the book. The shape of victory has been authoritatively set by the lamb who was slain. It's no coincidence that when the saints, God's holy people, are depicted in Revelation as if they were an army riding at Jesus' side, they are never depicted fighting or killing or touching a weapon at all. According to Revelation, those who will share in the victory of Christ, the conquering king, are the martyrs. Those who have willingly offered up their own lives as a sacrifice to God, just as Jesus offered up his. This is what conquering means in Revelation. It means remaining faithful even unto death. Victory is cross-shaped in Revelation from first to last. The book of Revelation does contain many images and symbols of divine judgment. Uh, Remember, we saw in the Old Testament prophets that God's judgment is God's right-making power. A key part of Revelation's message to first-century Christians who are sacrificing and suffering for their faith is that God will not allow injustice to stand forever. God will vindicate the martyrs. The only question is how God's justice will be accomplished. And by the end of Revelation, we get our answer. Many people have a sort of vague impression that Revelation is full of long, drawn-out, bloody battles. In Revelation 19, Jesus finally takes the field for the great showdown against evil. And this is how Revelation describes the scene. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war justly. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and on his head were many royal crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He wore a robe dyed with blood, and his name was called the Word of God. Heaven's armies, wearing fine linen that was white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword that he will use to strike down the nations. He is the one who will rule them with an iron rod. And he is the one who will trample the winepress of the Almighty God's passionate anger. He has a name written on his robe and on his thigh. King of kings, and Lord of Lords. Uh, There are a couple of things I want you to notice about this epic final battle description. Uh, First of all, even now, the only weapon that Jesus carries is a sword in his mouth, the truth. Uh, Second, even though the battle hasn't yet begun, Jesus' robes are already bloody. Why? Why? Because it turns out that the blood that will win the war is not the blood of enemies that Jesus crushes. The blood that Jesus is wearing here is his own. The beasts and the kings and all of their armies gather for war, but it turns out there isn't even a battle. The moment that the slain lamb and his saints step out on the field, the war is already over. Because it turns out that the decisive victory of evil had already been won on the cross. The only thing that remained was for Jesus to carry his victory to the field. All the powers of evil are broken by his simple word of judgment. 
All of the symbols and the visions of Revelation turn out to be working together to point us toward a few fundamental truths about history. First, the bad news. We humans will not ever solve the problem of evil. The war that's being waged is much bigger than us. Sometimes in quieter moments of history, we start thinking that things are going well, that maybe we're going to pull it together and usher God's kingdom in ourselves. And then some new form of horror springs up and we're forced to discover the truth anew. We cannot save ourselves. Divine intervention is going to be required to get us out of this mess. Uh, Second, the good news. There is hope. The world is going to be rescued. Good is going to win. And that's not going to happen because we will improve our way into Christ's kingdom by collective action. The fate of the world is assured because God is in control. God is coming to judge evil, to free captives, to make wrongs right. All that opposes God's will for life will finally be put down by God's own hand. Uh, Third, how will this great victory over evil be accomplished? The crucial blow has already been dealt. History belongs to the lamb who was slain. He paid for it with his own blood. In sacrificing himself, in laying down his life for friends and for enemies, Jesus has broken the back of evil. Evil can still do some damage. It can rage for a short time, but it has been dealt a mortal blow. When the crucified one takes the field wearing his own blood, one word of truth from him will turn evil into dust. So if this is where history ends up, what about us here and now? Well, our choices today matter because inconsequential as they might seem, we are participating in a larger cosmic struggle. One way or another, we are choosing a side. Jesus' people are called to come out from the greed and idolatry and indulgence that kings and merchants and empires are constantly chasing. And we are called to join the Lamb's resistance. We resist by refusing to bow down to cultural idols. We resist by declining to compromise for the sake of comfort. We resist by taking up no weapon except the sword of truth. We resist by joining our blood with the Lamb's blood, shed for love of enemies. Revelation is clear on this point. Those who share the Lamb's wounds will also share his victory. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This is exactly the future Revelation tells us to expect. In the end, evil will be gone and heaven and earth will be one. The garden of creation that opened up the story in Genesis will become a garden city where God and redeemed humans live and work and play and create together forever. This is the future that's coming, according to John, and the way you align your allegiance right now will determine your place in it. So choose the lamb. Align yourself with the one whose death has conquered history.